Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is super exciting, uh, just because this is the first time that we've ever done anything like this. Uh, special thanks to my amazing partner, Michaela. Uh, do you want to wave, Michaela? Yeah. Hello. Uh, when we started this group, I mean, what was it like? We started June 1st, I guess. and. Um, we were just five friends that wanted to ride our bike downtown and um, and help clean up our city after um, after we saw what was going on down there and we wanted to amplify um, the voices of the Black Lives Matter movement um, in the way that we knew how to. Um, so thanks for joining us and being a part of that. We started out, like I said, with five people and now we're, I think, over 1,400 people um, that are ready and willing to go um, to do good things for our city. So thank you all for um, for being a part of that. Um, all right. So with that, I guess we'll get started. Um, thank you for joining us for our Juneteenth history lecture. Uh, like I said, when Michaela and I started the Chicago Cleanup Crew Facebook group, we had no idea how many people wanted to get involved to help clean up our city. Um, and our mission continues to change. Um, as throughout the world, many continue to demand justice for our Black brothers and sisters like Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Oluwatoyin Salu, Tony McDade, Raya Milton, and Dominique Remy Fells. Today we're here to learn about Juneteenth, the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. Unfortunately, we live in a society that can alter history to fit a glorified narrative, and many of us might not have heard until Juneteenth until relatively recently. So with that, let me be one of the first to say to you, Happy Juneteenth! Today you'll notice that our lecturer um, is a white woman, Lydia Loreiro. This is not a mistake. Currently, we have been heavily relying on Black people to educate us while they're forced to carry the heavy emotional burden of being the constant target of systemic racism in a country that was built on tenets of white supremacy. By having Lydia teach us about Juneteenth, we invite you as a non-Black ally to do your part in learning Black history and encourage its integration into our school's curriculums. Cultural integrity and academics is crucial to the development and success of a diverse society that values diverse voices. I say that as a gay Hispanic immigrant educated in a predominantly white school. Seeing yourself, seeing yourself represented in your textbooks and being a living reminder of the people that paved the way to your ability to prosper can move mountains. I didn't see myself represented in a textbook until my college years when I had chosen to study Latin American politics. As allies, it's important to promote educational integrity for our brothers, sisters, and gender non-conforming community members. So I thank you for taking that first step. Um, and I thank you, Lydia, for being here today. So with that, I'd like to introduce Lydia Luredo. Lydia received her BA from the University of Iowa in history with a certification in international business. She went on to receive her master's in secondary social studies education from the University of Iowa and later, learned her, later earned her EDS in educational leadership from the National Lewis University. She's taught social studies at Boston College High in Dorchester, Massachusetts, which is why I know I like you so much because you know what the Jesuit education tradition is all about. Um, she's taught at West Leiden High School in North Lake and uh, is currently at Dwight D. Eisenhower High School in Blue Island, Illinois. Currently, aside from teaching social studies at Dwight D. Eisenhower, she serves as a, pr a principal intern, a teacher leader, and an instructional coach, a position in which she collaborates with administration, faculty, and staff to meet the instructional needs of all those people across all departments. So please join me in welcoming Miss Lydia Loredo. Thank you so much, Pedro. I really appreciate that introduction um, on so many different levels. I'm happy to see that some of my colleagues are here. I see Jermaine, I see Jen. This makes me so excited Michaela's here. There's many times when I might lean on them to contribute a little bit to this conversation. 
I think that they have some really great perspectives that could help inform us as well. Um, before I start sharing my screen, um, I'm going to use a platform called Pear Deck. So if you're working off of a phone, and just be patient because it might be buffering a little bit here and there, but if you have your computer with you, that'd be wonderful. And I will show you how to exactly join this. Michaela and I were experimenting with it before. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, please ignore all the stuff in the background. <laughs> and then let me get started. Uh, so where you're gonna go is, here it is. You're gonna go to joinpd.com and you're gonna type in this WLBTM. If you're on a laptop, it's a little bit easier to do that. If you're on your phone, it's fine. Then just pay attention through um, the video as, as I'm presenting some of these things. Okay. I'm just gonna sit here. While I'm waiting for you guys to join this, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background of myself. Um, like Peter said, I've been teaching for quite a long time. I started off in Boston after we left Iowa. I have kind of an interesting history in that um, my parents um, were teachers, my grandparents were teachers, my aunts and uncles were all teachers, and then half of them are from the South, the other half are from the North. So I grew up with two very different perspectives from my grandmothers. Um, one was the descendant of Confederates, the other one was descendant of Union soldiers. Um, so I often heard a lot growing up about the Civil War. I don't know if many of the younger generations now hear that history is as alive for them as it was for me. Um, and I don't think I'm that old, but it was still something that was <laughs> discussed in our households growing up. So for me, Black history is American history. We were always taught it. Um, sometimes with the best intentions and sometimes unfortunately with the definite racist point of view. Um, so it was interesting growing up listening to this and I always took classes um, when I was in school that centered around not only black history but Latin American history, um, international affairs, just trying to understand my place in the world. All right, so it looks like we've got 19 people uh, I'm going to assume that they're all ready, and if you don't want to participate in the PD, that's fine. You can just pay attention as we go along. So I'm going to start class. Um, at any point, if you do want to join in, though, all you have to do is go to that joinpd.com, and it's going to be always in the top right corner of my presentation, the code. So, um, so welcome and congratulations on the first step of educating yourself regarding Juneteenth. Um, today's agenda is uh, as listed. We're gonna be going first with a brief introduction of why I agreed to do this. And then also we're gonna start off with the Black National Anthem. Then I'm gonna go over briefly a very, very brief overview of the peculiar institution known as chattel slavery in the United States of America, and actually through North, Central, and South America. Um, from there, we're gonna discuss a very brief overview of the history of emancipation and a bit of, about uh, abolition. Then we're gonna discuss why, Junete why Juneteenth and why it should be a national. In fact, my argument will be it should be a federal holiday for all not just a national holiday, but as a federal holiday, um, and why it should be so celebrated throughout the country today, okay? Um, if you could, just for a second, I would like for you to try this out. If you could tell me how comfortable you currently feel explaining the history of Juneteenth to someone else. So you just drag your blue dot, I'll just show you. So it's pretty cool with this. I can see that some of us are extremely comfortable with it, but the majority of us are just learning. And that's amazing that you're here. So thank you. Um, I really, I don't know, it's my heart hope when I see people trying to educate themselves on something new. All right. 
So let's get started. So before we, we actually go over more of the history lesson, let's see if you knew that there is a Black national anthem. On yours it says true and false. Uh, I apologize for that, I couldn't change it. So true is yes, false is no. So if you just let us know. Again, this is anonymous, so let's be honest. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't know there was a black national anthem. Michaela taught me that, and I think Jermaine taught me that once one time before as well, along with Jen, my English teachers out there. They definitely taught me that there is a black national anthem, which is something I think we actually sang in elementary school um, without realizing it. And a lot of times you might have sang it in church if you happen to be Christian. And if you're not, who cares? You should have learned it anyway. So the second question I know is, if you said yes, do you know the title of it? And I'm sorry, English teachers, it should say, do you know the title, not did you know the title? You guys can reel on me later. <laughs> so I'm assuming if you didn't know there was a national anthem, you're not gonna respond to that one. But if we're about half and half. Right? So it's pretty cool. Now here's the real challenge. If you know the title, can you sing the whole thing? And if you say yes, I might call on you. <laughs> I won't call on you. I'm gonna let someone else sing it for us. Yeah, again. Some of us can sing the whole thing. And once I knew what it was, I actually knew a lot of the words. I didn't know the whole thing though, so I'm not gonna lie. All right, the cool thing about the Black National Anthem is that it is the song Lift Every Voice and Sing. And I will not attempt to sing any of it. I am completely tone deaf. I was told by a nun when I was young to please mouth the words. And that's my story of being emotionally scarred at the age of seven. So I will not be singing for you at all. But it was written in 1899 by the man standing in the top right corner of the photo. That's James Weldon Johnson. He was the leader of the NAACP down in Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville's been in the news quite a bit lately. I'm sure you guys might have paid attention to it. If not, um, the Republican convention has just been moved to there. But um, it was known for a large black community that was actually really well-educated and well-off and trying to promote upward mobility for their students. Um, it was written originally as a po poem and then set to music by his brother, John Rosamond Johnson, um, and then first performed in uh, 1900 by 500 school children. I can only imagine how it must have sounded to hear that song sung for the first time by 500 school children to celebrate Lincoln's birthday at this segregated school. Um, but since we can't get a recording of that, I'm sorry to say you're gonna have to listen to John Legend sing it. I apologize, it's just awful for you. So here we go. John Legend just recorded this last month. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing the song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song. Full of the hope that the 
blessing has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song. Um, and I think when we start looking at the history of enslavement in the United States, it's important that we kind of keep that song at our heart when he talks about the harmonies of liberty and letting it resound and having a full of faith that the dark past has taught us that we can actually learn from those who came before us. So in that being said, I'm going to make an argument throughout this presentation that for too long, many of our textbooks in our classrooms have, and in our society in general, has been dominated by a romanticized loss cause view of the antebellum era during which the Civil War, or as my Southern grandmother called it, the War of Northern Aggression and the Reconstruction Era has been demonized as um, just a dark history. To me, it's a history of um, horrible actions, but also um, when we look at Reconstruction, and I encourage you all to do a better job of where we failed as teachers in the past, educating yourself about Reconstruction, radical Reconstruction, the attempts of creating equality for all. I, I highly encourage that you need to read more about it and do a better job of, than, than my generation did of educating your own children about it. Um, in, in those ways, we can truly confront our ingrained systematic racism that has pervaded our history. And we can reflect on the ways in which we have failed to guarantee equality and freedom for large populations. Um, the reason that I am here today is because I, I have always tried at Eisenhower High School and actually in Boston to give voice to the students who felt left out of the historical narrative. I always looked at my students and knew that they had a yearning inside of them to know their history, not just my history. And I looked at them and saw my history as their history. So please open your hearts to that and keep doing the great work. You have joined a longer line um, in history of those who've sought to expand access to power to include marginalized voices and to raise awareness for many who've been silenced for far too long. And with that, I'm very humble to be asked to give this presentation. I'm humble because I know there's so many others who could do this instead of me. So thank you. And by the way, um, thank you too for the donation. It is going to be set up as a scholarship for students who are interested in history at my high school, which is 50% Hispanic and 50% African American. And with this money, I'm hoping that we can have it continue in perpetuity you know, for not just one year. So thank you. Um, whoops. So before we get started looking at this uncomfortable history of chattel slavery in the United States, I would just like to ask you if you could just text one fact that you know or one question that you were always maybe afraid to ask about American slavery.
Oh my gosh, you guys, there are so many wonderful questions here and I'm going to try and answer a lot of them. I want to share them, but I, I um, also wanted to make them anonymous. So um, I'm just going to address a couple of them here and there. And then hopefully as I continue throughout this lecture, we can um, answer more and more of them, all right? Um, some of you are asking about why Abraham Lincoln is credited with the um, and seen as a hero in American history. What is chattel slavery? You've never actually heard that term before, which amazes me. Um, you're wondering where slavery actually originated. So let me just back up just a little bit. And I'm going to go to the next slide and hopefully I can start getting to some of these questions. Um, and then we start learning too, like some of you know about the Three-Fifths Compromise. I'm going to discuss that as well. Um, and then, yes, we are all relearning everything. I mean, this is the great thing about history is like you can just delve into a rabbit hole of information and start exposing yourself more and more and more. And it becomes almost an obsession when you start wanting to learn about every facet of these stories. Just know that you're exploring the stories of humanity with this. So thank you for asking these questions. Hopefully I'll do justice to it. All right. What you guys are saying is fairly true. When we were taught black history um, in school throughout much of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, all right, when some of you guys weren't even born yet, we were taught with this concept of like the contented slave. We talk about a lot about the fact that um, Gone with the Wind was one of the most popular movies and celebrated movies in movie history. And now it's being banned from HBO because it perpetuated this myth that blacks were happier to be enslaved than afterwards. When in reality, historians have proved through the work of Henry Louis Gates, the work of Eric, um, oh my gosh, um, now I just lost my book, but through the work of reconstruction historians, what we know now is that slaves once informed that the troops were moving in, voted with their feet. They left plantations. They freed themselves. Let me say that again. Emancipation did not start in 1862 with Abraham Lincoln. It started with the choice of, I am freeing myself now and I am leaving this place that you no longer can control me, nor my heart, nor my family, and I will find them. And they voted with their feet. So enslavement was imposed upon these people it was imposed upon their descendants. And when I talk about chattel slavery, I'm talking about the concept that was very new to the Americas. The history of slavery is a history of humankind. We've had slavery throughout the history of humanity. What was unique about North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean is the fact that we brought people who looked so different from another continent into these continents and we kept their children enslaved after they died. That's chattel slavery. That's that continuous line of, you not just served your indentured servitude like my ancestors did. So my ancestors on one side of my family came over and we have records of their names, their ages, when they came, how they arrived as indentured servants after their seven years were over, they were freed, right, with a certain amount of property. Initially in 1619, many Africans who were brought here had that same contract, but over time with Native Americans dying out and no longer could they rely on indentured servants coming over, it became an economic need to keep cheap labor, right, cheap labor, and so they just enslaved the parents and the grand, then the children, then the grandchildren, and generations were enslaved through this. Okay, so we'll talk a bit more about that. Then you're talk usually in school about the Civil War and how boom, everybody's free. Boom, you know they're able to get their 40 acres and a mule. Boom, we get the establishment of Jim Crow. All right. And then that's it. Nobody wants to talk about it again. Nobody wants to talk about black history until the Civil Rights Movement. Brown v. Board of Education. Segregation's over, right? Everybody's going to school together. We're happy, happy, happy. And you guys now have equality. Stop worrying about history. No. Ta-Nehisi Coates um, recently wrote an article about the need for reparations. I recommend 
every person should read this article from the Atlantic. The Atlantic Monthly has been doing a great job covering the history of slavery, the history of redlining, the history of systematic racism. Go educate yourself and read these stories. But what we're missing when we just stick to this narrative of segregation is over, we're missing the stories in between, the narratives and the humanity that connect us to each other. We miss the fact that you guys weren't taught about the massacre in, um, um, oh my gosh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I, I learned about in school. And I, and I think Jermaine's about the same age as me and John's the same age as me. In the late 80s and 90s, we kind of had this window of time in which I went to school at Homewood Flossmoor High School in which I was in a very extreme school. I was taught Black Boy by Richard Wright. I was asked to read The Invisible Man by um, Ellison. I was asked to study Black history within my class because I had Black friends, Jewish friends, Hispanic friends, Indian friends. So our teachers, it was kind of a unique period. We were kind of pushed to read about those around us. Um, since since the mid-90s, Michaela and I talked about this, segregation has been growing stronger and stronger throughout the country. It is less likely that your children will go to that diverse of a school, either economically or socially or racially any longer. It's the fact, we need to do a better job. We need to support our public schools and get kids back together. That's the only way we can improve. Right, sorry. So now I'm gonna stop with that and we'll get to here. I get a little passionate. <laughs> it's, my kids call it the Karen and me. I apologize, I am not a Karen. I will not call the manager. <laughs> but what I will do is I will show you this. Um, I'm gonna show you this video. This is where history is really interesting now. Um, historians across the country are going through and they're looking at slave manifest ships. They're looking at statistics. These are things because we can't get up the personal stories, but what we can see are numbers, all right, of when people are leaving and when people are coming in. Um, historically, you were taught that the first slaves ar uh, arrived to the American colonies in 1619. That's not true. Um, all that does is provide many students with a chronological understanding of the approximate year that Africans were introduced to their enslavement by the Dutch, English, Spanish, and Portuguese traders. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now, and I'll pause it a little bit, is we're going to watch this brief video. Each dot represents a slave ship, okay? Each dot represents a slave ship. You're going to see the first slave ships arriving to North America. I want you to see if you can figure out what year that was. Um, then you're going to see, though, where the majority of the slave ships are going to. Um, so just make a note of that and then try and figure out what years you see a large increase to North America and then when do you see a major drop off. All right, so there's four different things I'm going to ask you to look at. So remember each dot, so you saw one already go, it was 1549. Oop, there they go. So two. The bigger the dots, the more the ships, all right? It's not just one ship.
I just wanted to pause you guys, 1794, if you notice there was a major drop off in the slave trade that year. It's because, um, and this is one history you could educate yourself, Haiti had experienced two set overtures leading of the Haitian Revolution during the French Revolution, all right? So the first successful slave revolution in the Americas occurs in Haiti, which is now one of the poorest nations in the world. And that's because of a long history of systematic racism against that nation for exerting their own independence. But then we see it picking back up again. Notice, and I wanted you to notice between 1800 really and 1808, it picks up a lot here in North America. And then boom. And then it slows, slows down a little bit. mainly going to Brazil now. And then it's, okay. Um, go ahead and please try and answer some of those questions. If you don't want to answer those, that's fine, but um, yes. Yeah, so here's, Here's where a lot of people don't understand with history. Many of us think that slaves came primarily to um, work on cotton plantations. The majority of slaves that were exported from Africa, um, kidnapped and then murdered in, um, on their, their um, middle passage to the Americas, found themselves either in the Caribbean or in Brazil, where they worked on sugar plantations. It was really sugar that brought these people over. Sugar, and then in North America, initially it was indigo, rice, and, and sugar as well. It's only in the late 1790s that we get the cotton gin being invented and cotton becoming the major commodity that comes out of North America. Prior to the invention of the cotton gin and in the three-fifths compromise, um, in the three-fifths compromise of the Constitution, that constitution had, the founders had, had estimated that slavery would be dying out, that they wouldn't be needing as many slaves as white populations grew. In reality, with the invention of the, of the cotton gin, slavery becomes reamplified. They need more workers to keep up with the demand that was growing from the first industrial revolution in the textile mills in the northern uh, states. So states like Massachusetts and the Lowell Mills are driving the demand for cotton that's being shipped over to England and to Europe, all right? So to say that it's just the Southerners who relied on cotton is the lie that we tell ourselves. It's truly the demand that was, that was built into that first industrial revolution that was seeking that commodity be, to be brought north, all right? The other map that I find really interesting is this one, and it's the history of the spread of the U.S. slavery. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that slavery um, existed in Vermont, you know, it existed in Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, um, Maryland, and then moved southward. Obviously, there were more slaves in the South and the Virginias and eventually West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, into Georgia. But if you click on this, this one here, this comes from Professor Lincoln Mullen. He's at, I think, George Washington University. He's gone through and he's shown us how, using the census material, we can see how slavery is beginning to move westward, all right, as people are settling out west um, and taking then cotton primarily and tobacco with them as they go. Both are pretty abusive um, commodities when farmed. So the need for land just keeps building and building and they are moving further and further out, which is straining relations between the Northern states and the Southern states and eventually leads to the Civil War. Like I didn't know, and you can hover over, you can look at this later on, but for instance, like the Mormons took with them their slaves to Utah. You know, like a lot of people don't know that you can find slaves all the way out there. And then um, here in Texas, this is where a lot of 
planters moved, especially prior to the Civil War and then during the Civil War. They took their slaves out to Texas, hoping that they would not be caught by the Union armies out there and they could maintain their property rights. All right. So when we get to 1860 at the beginning of the Civil War, well, yeah, you can see exactly Rosario, Texas has over 75% are enslaved, only six are free. And yet, if we look at that, you guys, the entire population, there's more slaves than whites. And there's more slaves than whites, not only in some of these areas of Texas, but in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, there's more blacks than whites. Which when you get to reconstruction is why you see during radical reconstruction those the, the years after the Civil War until 1877 when it ends, why you see so many blacks being elected into the House of Representatives and the Senate into state and local governments. You see black Americans actually now being elected into those offices. And then when Reconstruction ends and the rise of Jim Crow, we don't see them again until the 1970s, 1980s, all right? So we see then the stripping away and disenfranchisement of, of black Americans, okay. So I, want, I wanted to show you this because I want you to understand that this history still impacts us today. Too many times I've had to hear people talk about, oh, you know, slavery has been over for 170 years. Who cares anymore? We should care. It impacts us today. And as a result, when you look at the history of slavery and you think about families divided, families sold off, families taking all over and the trauma imposed upon these people and that trauma carries through generations, generations upon generations. And then the trauma is reignited during Jim Crow and perpetuated up until now. What we have is um, we have a responsibility to deal with it, to confront it. And too often we have tried to move, to ignore it. All right, so do me a favor and just give me one fact that you know or one question that you have actually about emancipation. And this one, I hope it's okay if I share them. Yeah. These are really good questions. These are awesome. You guys are asking terrific questions. I love this one is why do we still see Abraham Lincoln as a hero? Um, I'm gonna go to address that one. I think that Abraham Lincoln um, is a, you know, for the time in which he lived, he was definitely a forward thinker and he was one who was willing to change. These days we call them flip floppers. I would say he was a person who was extremely intelligent, who was willing to acknowledge when he was wrong and listen to multiple perspectives. One perspective that he definitely listened to was Frederick Douglass over time, who pushed and pushed and pushed him to emancipate or free the slaves. And that question of couldn't you be emancipated on your own? Isn't it a self-imposed action? Why wouldn't it be that they just free themselves? It's true, but at the same time, when you have slave catchers running throughout the area and you have no police force that would prevent someone from taking you back to be tortured horribly before put to death in front of others. Emancipation wasn't necessarily a reality for many. I mean, Harriet Tubman is truly a hero when you think about the ways in which she endangered her lives and the lives of those that she helped escape. Like, I, once again, I recommend 
you know, there's really great books recently. Uh, the Water Dancer, for instance, I just finished reading. Underground Railroad, the magical realism one that pulls actual real um, examples of how escapees or runaways were treated. You know, you should definitely read The Invisible Man if you have a, a chance, even though that's not dealing with slavery, but it's this idea of being invisible in the world, you know, um, based on what you look like rather than who you are inherently. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln is a complicated historical figure, but let me put it this way, no other person would have done what he did in issuing that in 1862. And we see the complete opposite when Andrew Johnson becomes president after his death. So, you know, he's, he's hero worshiped because he was assassinated like JFK. So who knows if our interpretation of him would have changed over time. But at the same time, he did change his behavior and his writings, you know, when others would not. So I think that's something that we have to just kind of make people are of their, of their period, you know, um, and he was willing to change. Um, so let's talk about this. Some one question was this, did the Emancipation Proclamation written by Lincoln on September 22nd, 1862 free all slaves? Is this a true or false? Okay, I'm gonna say, in spite of everything, you guys know this part of history, so good. <laughs> That's, you're correct, it did not. So, okay, at least our high school teachers and college teachers taught us something, so there we go. Uh, let me go to the next one. Yeah, you're right, false. Um, if you listen to NPR this morning, you could actually hear them reading the Emancipation Proclamation in which it stated that the Slaves, only the slaves in rebel states were freed, while any other state or region that was currently occupied by Union forces could maintain their slaves. Now, you know, um, he did that basically as a warning, and it was this executive order um, is a, I'm going to pause, is definitely a warning to those states to basically you should quit fighting. So, the executive order was ordered into effect on January 1st, 1863. Is this true or false at all? At this point, all slaves were freed. Okay, so a lot of you guys said false, a couple of you said true. Um, this one's actually false. Uh, yes, it did free the slaves in those Confederate states. Um, however, once again, only in um, those Confederate states that were being conquered by Union forces. Um, what it was meant to do in Frederick Douglass had pushed Lincoln and others, abolitionists had pushed Lincoln to free all slaves. Lincoln was apprehensive on his ability to do so. This was a definite reach um, to strip people of their property rights and he could only constitutionally, remember he's a lawyer, he argues that he can only constitutionally free those slaves in, in states that are in active open rebellion. Um, so in states like Maryland, he did not think that he would be able, nor did he think that the Supreme Court would support him um, freeing slaves in those states. So as a result, it was only in these states that, that were in active rebellion that he felt as though he could free them. What it also did was it encouraged then Union forces to recruit um, Blacks to come and join the Union Army. And the Confederates were trying to recruit slaves by promising their, their emancipation to fight for Confederate forces which people don't always know about as well. So uh, let's just put it this way. The black Americans who, free, who were freed in those areas chose to fight for the North. 
Then on December 6, 1865, is it the 13th Amendment that emancipates all slaves? It's true or false? It's hard to be done. Okay, good. A lot of us have answered. Um, this one, we're a little bit more divided. So that's good. That tells me something. Um, this one is actually true. The 13th Amendment is the formal uh, abolition and emancipation of, of all slaves throughout the country. Part of Reconstruction, when they, you were petitioning to make it back into the country, um, and in order to end Northern troops being within your state, you had to adopt the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These amendments are considered the second most important drastic change and the second founding of the Constitution in our country to make it uh, more inclusive of all. This is where do, in the 14th Amendment, this is the amendment that was just recently used in order to protect trans gay um, workers in the workplace this week. So when we look at the 14th Amendment, it's still very much living in the most cited Supreme Court amendment that exists. Um, however, what it does not do is it does not protect black families from the eventual backlash after troops are removed from the South um, and white begin to reassert their control over their state legislatures through the use of the KKK and native terrorism. It is that native terrorism and um, this rise of the myth of Antebellum South that, um, that begins to impose a new system of, of partial enslavement on peoples of the southern um, states through Jim Crow, all right? Now, I don't want to say that the North was much better. The North has its own racist history as well. And we need to do a really good job of educating ourselves about that racist history. So this becomes then, if December 6th, this is the passage of the 13th Amendment, if September 22nd was the passage of, you know, the writing of the Emancipation Proclamation, if January 1st was what Frederick Douglass celebrated as emancipation, then why Juneteenth? Why Juneteenth? Yeah, okay, so a lot of you guys have been hearing about Juneteenth. If you watched Jimmy Kimmel Live last night, you got to see, uh, um, who is it, who is on there? Um, oh my gosh, now, Be Happy, who sang that song, Be Happy? Pharrell Williams was on there, or, yeah, talking about the importance of Juneteenth. Um, I'm gonna tell you right now, you guys are all correct. It really, a lot of you said Texas. It comes out of Texas, Galveston, Texas. I think what, we have to understand is that history is extremely complicated, that it's not for historians or politicians to determine the proper dates to celebrate emancipation. It was the slave or the recently freed slave stories to tell, and they chose June 19th in Texas. And from there, they spread this idea of Juneteenth. 
you know, as they migrated out of Texas later on. So um, I called a friend of mine um, whose daughter goes to school with my, my daughter, um, and I had asked her to zoom in with us, but unfortunately she's running a major Juneteenth celebration town in Houston, Texas right now, so she couldn't join us. Um, but she did send me a couple of links for us to listen to. The first one is a link from um, the Library of Congress and um, our National Folk History Service Today that they had. is Juneteenth. So I'm gonna play this. Hopefully it works. Today is Juneteenth, the holiday that marks what happened in Texas on June 19th, 1865. Slave owners in the state had kept news of the Emancipation Proclamation issued two years earlier from their slaves. And on this day, 150 years ago, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas with 2,000 troops and a message, slaves were free. Laura Smalley, born into slavery in Texas, was a child when it happened. We didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, just turned just like you turned some out, you know. They didn't know where to go. They turned us out just like, you know, you turn out cattle, <laughs> I say. They didn't know where to go after freedom broke, she says. Turned us out, just like you turn out cattle. Smalley recalled this in 1941 in Hempstead, Texas. She was interviewed by John Henry Falk. That interview now preserved at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. She told Falk that before June 19th, the slaves on the plantation she lived on didn't know slavery had been abolished after the Civil War. You know, old Marshall didn't tell you, you know, it was free. He didn't tell you that? No, he didn't tell. They went there and turned them loose on the 19th of June. That's why, you know, you celebrate that day, colored mm -hmm. folks. Celebrate that day. Celebrate that day. That's Laura Smalley speaking in 1941 about her memories of Juneteenth, the day 150 years ago that slaves in Texas were granted their freedom more than two years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. So my friend Rhonda sent me this one as well. Um, I'm looking at the time right now, and as I said, you guys are gonna be able to have this, but this video is, has been put out in Texas, going on, over again the history of Juneteenth and showing the arrival of General Gordon Granger. I hope you don't mind. I'm gonna press play on it. Um, it's only, I think, two minutes. Oh, a minute. Open a U.S. history book, and chances are its author will quickly point out January 1st, 1863, the date President Abraham Lincoln, with one proclamation, orders and declares that all persons held as slaves shall be free. What that same history book might fail to mention is what happened to these words once they arrived on the shores of Galveston, Texas, more than two years after Lincoln wrote them. In the 1860s, word didn't travel like it did now. And in 1865, months after General Robert E. Lee's surrender, word of the end of the Civil War had yet to hit the Southern state and its quarter of a million slaves. And then came General Gordon Granger's arrival in Galveston, June 19, 1865, and General Order Number 3, all slaves are free. Juneteenth was born. While Juneteenth celebrations continue to varying degrees, in the U.S. for decades, it would take until 1980 for Texas to become the first state to declare it a holiday. Today, 47 states recognize it and the District of Columbia, a chapter of our history, were far too long left out of the books designed to document it. But no longer. Juneteenth, or as the National Museum of African American History and Culture now calls it, our country's second Independence Day. Um, I just wanted to show one more map. I know I have this obsession with maps, but I think this is really important to see. If you notice with Texas, and the reason why maybe in Chicago we might not have heard about Juneteenth as much um, is, number one, we live in segregated communities. Let's be honest, Chicago is the most segregated city in the country, and we need to acknowledge that. But also, if you look at the map for Texas, Right? The majority of Texas Blacks moved to places like Minneapolis, Davenport, Quincy, St. Louis, and then out to Oakland, um, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Those cities have much larger traditions of, 
um, Juneteenth. But now it is expanding throughout the rest of the country. And it has expanded prior to this time period. It's just that white people didn't really acknowledge it. All right, so I'm not gonna, and now the attention is, and corporations are now acknowledging it. There's so much history to understand. We have not even given any justice to any of it. It's just an introduction. But what I do recommend is that you begin the process of educating yourself. We need to do a better job of teaching our kids about the history of emancipation and reconstruction, about the broken um, promises made by reconstruction, such as 40 acres and immutable, and, um, the, and the Civil Rights Acts and how they've been co-opted over time. Uh, we need to do a much better job of approaching and saying that movies like um, Gone with the Wind or Birth of a Nation are examples of racist history in our, in our country. We need to learn about the Great Migrations, the first one being around World War I, the second one after World War II, and how they changed the face of our country. Uh, we also need to do a good job of reading Raisin in the Sun, going to those performances, understanding redlining, understanding economic racism, understanding why it is that Afri uh, Black Americans are much more likely to have um, health problems, experience poverty, experience the inability to um, buy homes, maintain their homes, lost their homes disproportionately after 2008. Um, we needed to do a good job of talking about, in a realistic point of view, about the need for reparations. You know, I, I'm going to come down on the side of Tony East Coast with, with that this country should be paying reparations, and you can disagree with me on that, and that is completely acceptable, but we'll have a long conversation about it. Um, then we need to talk about the long history of civil rights, not just the 1950s and 60s, how civil rights has been there. And... You know, it's interesting because I was talking with my husband today about it, and he's like, the difference between the United States and him being from Brazil is nobody really talks about racism in the history of civil rights in Brazil, you know? And here, at least, we're, we're confronting it. We have to. We have to do better. And then the reflection and investigation of our own personal biases. Um, so I'm hoping I moved the needle on this, but let's see if I did. <laughs> If you could, just let me know if you feel a little bit better. If you don't, that's cool. You guys are really sweet. <laughs> you guys are super sweet. I appreciate you so much. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not here, but I'm so happy to see, at least we're not really here anymore. All right, Michaela, I'm passing off this to you. <laughs> so I'm gonna mute myself. Okay. I first want to, wow. Um, thank you, Lydia, so much. I wanna share with everyone that I had, uh, when Pedro asked me if I knew anyone who could speak on Juneteenth and Lydia was the first person that came to mind and I, I wasn't sure, you know, I just went ahead and sent her a quick little text and she's like, absolutely. She didn't hesitate one bit when I asked her if she could be our uh, presenter on this day. And so um, we got on a quick phone call and here we are. So Lydia, thank you so much for the work and the time and effort you put into this. And um, she, even though she yelled at me about not accepting the money that we wanted to offer her. And so we're super grateful and where we're navigating that money too, to go to our um, our youth, our minority and in works of helping them, you know, have a better future for themselves. Um, I want to thank everyone else today for attending um, this 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 lecture. It means so much, you know. We, uh, to go back to the uh, Black National Anthem, "March On Till Victory Is Won." I mean, it's 2020, and we're still marching. I mean, we are literally marching the streets. But what's so powerful is that we're not marching alone. Um, you know, you all showing up today is showing that you care about self-improvement, um, racial uplifting, that you, you want to help make a difference. And I've had so many people reach out of like, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. And, and showing up today to learn about this day, which is symbolical in a sense too with Juneteenth of it being a representation of delayed freedom for Blacks and, and 
yet still, I mean, two, it took two and a half years for them to find out like we're free, yet it's still a delay. I mean, it, Lydia went through the history of things that has continuously held the population back, the community, um, humans back. And you guys see that we're fighting for humans. Um, and, and so it's a reminder that like no one is free unless we're all free. And, and you being here is showing um, that you're fighting for everyone to be free. It's a call to continue the fight for justice for all. And so I am just so thankful. Um, Pedro, I don't know if you're still here. I see you. Um, I'm so thankful for him organizing this too. He has been my partner in peace through all of this. And, and um, we have recorded this and I hope that you all get a chance to share with others too, um, because the better we know more, um, the greater the change can be in the end. So thank you everyone. Okay, all right, enjoy your day. Um, we are gonna post the link. There are so many events happening all throughout Chicago, um, West Side, South Side, um, north side downtown so go out into the community and partake and uh, enjoy the beautiful weather take care everybody